What is up, everybody? Welcome to The Stack. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. I'm Krang. I mean, I'm Pete. And on The you Stack, we talk Krang. about a ton of books that have come out this week. No advanced reviews this week. All stuff this week, current. Let's get into it with a big one. Justice League versus Godzilla versus Kong, number one. From DC Comics, written by Brian Bucciolato, art by Christian Duce. And you know what you're getting from this, right from the title. You are getting a deep character study of the relationship between Superman and Lois Lane. That's what people want from the title, and that's what we get, and that's all I have to say. I I was so surprised by this. Um, This issue centers around a proposal, and the actual aforementioned like Justice League versus all these uh, monsters... It's really just the Injustice League is sort of like, where are we? Uh Uh-oh. Very surprising uh, situation here. What did you think about this, Pete? I'm sure as a fan of Legendary's Monsterverse, you are highly anticipating this. How did you feel about the issue? Oh, he's in deep in thought. (laughs) Toy Man really gets a lot of play in this. And he's just like... Well, hold on. Let me throw out there. I was being a little glib at the beginning. I actually really like this issue because I think what they were going for here, I saw a bunch of reviews since this obviously goes up on a Tuesday, but I saw a bunch of reviews being like, oh, a slow start for this. And mind you, yes, you are expecting a knockdown drag out fight, but that's not how they structure these movies. These movies are no. yes. they're like, let's center the humans, find their emotional reality, and then we bring on the monsters. That's what they do here. And I love the fact that they do it with superman getting married or wanting to propose to lois and the rest of the justice league responding to that it legitimately like sets stakes for oh my god is something bad gonna happen to superman over the course of this book and i i kind of love that i agree with you and i also thought it was just one of the more candid casual studies of the injustice league where they're like you know well, I forget who says it. it was like, you know, maybe we don't win because we don't get along or something to that effect. <laughs> I was like, wow, this is sort of nice. And they're like, Toy Man, quit fucking it up. And then he does it twice over the course of the book. Uh, so like all that was fun. I also think it's strange that it's not Justice League versus Godzilla or Justice League versus Kong. I feel like from now on, why is it always Godzilla and Kong versus, and there's another thing. Why are they a package these days? I don't know. Godzilla versus Kong was a very fun movie, and I think that's part of it. I think also, not to get too into the backstory or anything, but like Legendary and WB, who owns DC Comics, have this weird business relationship that's had some fractious notes throughout their recent history in particular. So I think this is like, let's throw the whole kitchen sink in there and let's really sell it. It doesn't just need to be Justice League versus Godzilla. We throw Kong, who is always like, is he an ally? Is he against them? We don't know. It is weird that they have an entirely different giant monkey also in this issue. But I love it because he's a giant. I Grodd, even in this, is like, Hey, you big monkey too. Let's yeah, be friends. There's another monkey. Like there's a monkey. There's oh, oh, yes. And then there's also King Kong. And I was like, that's too many monkeys. We're complicating this a little bit Never too, much. too many. Never too many monkeys. What did you, Pete, now that you're back, what did you think about this one? Well, I, I think this is just a ton of fun. They were, they're just kind of piling ideas on top of ideas. And uh, it, it seems so uh epic you know there's just so much going on there's a proposal in the middle of all this madness so there's a lot of sweet moments while you're just like holy shit so i think it's a it's a fun idea and uh you know why not throw some more things in the mix you know what i mean i feel like when godzilla and kong meet each other they'd be like we don't need to fight haven't we again done this this. yeah let's just get along they should just we are i i did I think my favorite part of the issue, and this is just a such a tiny thing, but the, so the plot of it, and this is a spoiler here, if you don't want to know, but Toy Man gets this wish stone, essentially, out of the Fortress of Solitude that takes them to another dimension, which is the Monsterverse dimension, and they use that to bring the monsters back to the DC universe, which is like a lot of work to just get Godzilla and King Kong there when honestly they could show up and it would be fine. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's a moment when that's happening where it cuts to King Kong and he has like a question mark. He has an intero bag over his head and he's like, huh? 
and that to me yeah. like that's the fun that i want for the rest of this thing i want it to be ludicrous and over the top Lud but I, I don't think that's gonna happen because the legendary movies are very serious to a fault in terms of no we need to treat this concept with gravity uh yeah and there's nothing more i want from my monster fights than deep pathos from each of the monsters should have separate trauma that they're trying to resolve uh and pete you owe alex 50 bucks because he did say in tarot bang and that's a long-standing bet to you <laughs> <laughs> christian duche's art is perfect for this i do think godzilla looks great kong looks great the other monsters look great it's good superhero art it's very in the mode of i don't know i'm trying to think of a good uh, comparison but like a rafa sandoval or somebody like that somebody who mm, yeah all the crossovers for dc so they're throwing everything in there. Um, and like I said, I think there's a good surprising emotional hook here. So I'm very curious. I like the way you said that. Like, mm, there's hints of Sandoval in this. I really am picking up on there notes. Yes, yeah, I'm little getting little a light things. Sandoval. Here. Well, yeah. <laughs> oh. uh, Let's move on talk about Sensational <laughs> She-Hulk, number one from Marvel, written by Rainbow Rowell and Jessica Gao, the showrunner of She-Hulk on TV. TV She-Hulk, art by Andre Gillette. Streaming. In a hey, hey, no, hey, come on. in a rare bit of candor in not not Superman's candor. But yeah, candor. I was gonna say he's I was gonna say candor Andor or Candor. Yeah. Candor. At the end of this issue, editor Nick Lowe is like, Hey man, hey audience, we hey Alex specifically, because I'm spending this whole issue being like, Why is this a new number one? You're just continuing the pod of She Hulk is dating uh jack of hearts she has a punch club she's a lawyer how is she gonna balance all of this stuff it's the best romance comic on the stands etc etc um and at the end he's like well not enough people are reading this and we love this book so we gave it a new number one <laughs> and that's basically it i i love it though oh, as a you, big fan meant, of this book you meant candor i see yeah. what you were meant oh okay yeah <laughs> uh i i'm very down for that uh, because this book is very good. More people should read it. Let's do a new number one every week or month if we if we have to. What? This to me has just the right energy that I wish the She-Hulk um, streaming program had when it was um, airing on the streaming service that it airs on. You talking about that big She-Hulk energy? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, that's what I'm. Do, do, do. Um, Wait, yeah. Justin, I, hold on. I, I do want to get your opinion, Pete, because you were a fan of the She-Hulk TV program that was streaming so not a real tv program justin, what, <laughs> justin, what did you think of the backup story because that was by jessica jow who is the showrunner who is such a good showrunner that now marvel is going to do showrunners for all of their shows yeah i know she sat in on the edit of she hulk and they were like holy shit, you can do this let's let her write a, a tiny part of a comic too um, I like the backup. The fun little, like it's a little sketch of a uh, of a superhero story. Down for it, but this is just I the the first getting back to the front story. Like the romance is all there. I I love this love story. I love the workplace comedy stuff they're doing in this while also maintaining some real superhero bona fides. One of my faves of the week. I agree. This is really badass. I love it. I love this romance. Uh, I love the way she just kind of goes about her day. We get a real slice of life of what it's like to be She-Hulk. So I really thought that was fun. The Punch Club was a great time. Yes, please, more. Uh, Rainbow Wow is just absolutely killing it. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy we're getting more She-Hulk. What I'm a little worried about is this romance that i'm pulling for so hard it's just it's never seems to be on stable ground and that's mm -hmm. giving me a little anxiety but because of his place... unstable molecules yes hey well, that's the place that you want a rom-com you want that tension there i this is like pushing daisies meets superheroes is kind of what it is just because mm -hmm. you have jack of hearts who needs to suck up all this radiation to touch she hulk all she wants to do is touch him but also as they lay out on this issue with avengers disassembled it less led to the worst day of her absolute life so they have all this baggage all this backstory they also have a very sexy height difference going on here yes uh, hashtag uh, short king Oh my I God. guess it's it's really tall queen than yes. rather than yeah, short yeah, king. Yeah. I but. love working in Crusher Creel here and Titana. Yeah. I love Volcata. The shout out to her relationship with Molecule Man. I love all that. 
And, and also the fact that Punch Club, which I thought was maybe just a one-off, one-issue joke, the fact that they're really committing to it, I think is great. I'm going to say Jack of Hearts and She-Hulk are the new Rogan Gambit. And Ooh. let's make it make it that thing. Love it. I hope and, so, because, I, I, you know, he needs to start believing in himself a little bit more. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just... Uh, uh, yeah, they're they're. I love them, but they're also driving me nuts. I, Do you think and, is he your favorite card in the deck? Sure. <laughs> nice. I just want to give a shout out to Andre Gelat's art in particular. Yeah. I do love all the different body types in the issue. I think yeah. you know we end up particularly with a She Hulk book where everybody is like. We're naked, but our clothes are painted on very like superhero art. Usually here, like you were saying, Jack of Hearts is this tiny, cute little guy. She-Hulk is a big lady. Volcana is a different she size from so Titania cute. and everybody. Um, great book. Just back to front. Let's move to another great book, Back to Front. We reviewed the first 12 pages as an yeah. advanced review, but now it's finally out on stands, the full thing. We were able to read it. Hack slash Back to School, number one from Back Age Comics to by school. Zoe. Back so to good. School. Is this book good or does it get more respect? Right? Oh, my God. <laughs> That, that's good stuff what sucks Man, about that I joke love fresh, is this I love is the second take. time hearing it and it didn't get any better and the impression got worse which oh. is sad i will say it did get better because the impression got worse and i <laughs> we should workshop more stuff guys it's no. it's what we do we're professionals we're professional <laughs> journalists and comedians <laughs> and alex is a a, a professional impressionist all right, why don't we do a triple easy Indy into the review and actually talk about the bug first? Oh, easy with the word I, professional. I dare you to find a third reference to that movie. <laughs> How about that? I definitely cannot. Uh, uh, yeah, this I, is, wait, wait a second. You, Justin, you, I've heard you make another reference, uh, especially because of the, your favorite writer makes a cameo in this movie. Come on, dude. You. you I don't know. What Kurt you're Vonnegut, you're fired. I love Kurt Vonnegut. Here, yeah. uh, here's hey, the Kurt thing. Kurt Vonnegut, you're fired. If we give good compliments about this book, we're all gonna get laid, right? Oh my god! I think <laughs> you're just cool. doing. I think you're just doing him now. <laughs> I think so. No, this also, I've never is seen this movie. Cassie and Glad, Glad back. <laughs> That's to the clear. Beginning. Cassie and Vlad back to the beginning of their career as seen in Tim Seeley's Hack Slash book. Cassie has just killed her mom, found out about slashers. Vlad is this monstrous being who's very sweet and innocent and palling wrong with her. And in this issue, they get recruited by a high school for slasher killers. So uh, we one of the things that we're talking about with the advance is like, this is being sold as a YA book. And in the first half of the book, there's kids getting their heads cut off and brains and things. I started to feel it more with the full issue. And I absolutely am over the moon for this. Zoe Thurgood's art is so good. She has this exaggerated style where she stretches out the limbs and the situations, but it works perfectly for everything that's going on here, particularly the hyper violent stylization. But I love the characters we're setting up. It's so clean. It's so nice to have school for slashers. Um, I I'm think I think Zoe is the Thor of goodness. You know what I mean? Like she is just killing this art mm -hmm. style. I really love it. I love to see Cassie and ha Vlad back together again. Finally, this is just very exciting to kind of have the prequel to the hack slash universe. Uh, yeah, just so excited to have more hack slash. It's a, it's a fun, it's just a, a fun team. And I'm so excited for more material to read. Is, is Zoe is the Thor of goodness is from back to school too? That, oh, otherwise, that Zoe is the Thor of goodness, right? <laughs> wow. Nice. Wow. Uh, there's something about uh, Zoe's art that is so like unsettling while still being like really clean and nice, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it fits the tone of the book perfectly. I, You're right. I think. There is something like a little like well, the other shoes going to drop type of feeling to it, and, that, and that's very. Uh, I didn't really think about that. That's that's great that you said that because well, there is this really... uneasiness to it. Well, I think that comes through with Vlad in a certain way. The way that she draws Vlad, it's like you threw a pile of green things on the floor and it forms the vague shape of a human being. How dare you? No, but it works. Like, I, I love it. That is I love his the face. Fact... It's his body. Like, his body is lumps. Like, it's, it's a series of lumps. 
I love mm. the way she draws it versus like Cassie is just sort of lanky and her legs are too long and she's awkward in her body. S stop um, making fun of her, man. Come on, dude. It's disgusting and I hate this book. Let's oh. move on. Jay Garrick, The Flash, number one from DC Comics, written by Jeremy Adams, art by Diego Olartuiga to Gui, excuse me. Mm. Got that horribly wrong. Anyway, this is spinning off, surprisingly, of Stargirl, The Lost Children. Yes. Showing what happens when Judy Garrick, who is the long lost daughter of Jay Garrick and his wife, shows up again in modern continuity. Now her parents are old. She's still young. And they have to figure out an old mystery from their past. I was very surprised about the strong connection there, but I think as a direct follow-up in terms of the emotion of how do you deal with you are the same age, kind of no time has passed for you, suddenly your parents are 40, 60 years older, something like that. Like Much you, older. Yeah. How do you deal with that? I thought was very interesting. I agree. This had a lot of like nice emotional resonance I didn't expect. It, uh, I liked the villain setup, especially I thought was really cool. Uh, but I feel like the only thing with this is the way that DC deals with flashes is how Pete deals with cookies. He's like, boy, we've got, I got a lot of cookies here. I'll just eat another couple. I need to eat more cookies. More and more cookies is what I need to fix this cookie problem. There are just so many flashes to the point where every book is like a meta commentary on the number of flashes. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not saying we need to like kill a bunch of them or something, but just some the the conversation just needs to change a little bit about it where it's like, look, there's there's a picture in here where he's like, this is your family. It's like 50 people who are all very fast. I was I like, I feel like I'm listening to your villain origin story. I'm like, I'm not saying <laughs> we need to kill flashes, <laughs> but we need to uh, slow him down a little bit. But just, just only only one other thing. Like he's like, they're called speedsters, and I want to be like. Yeah, you don't need to explain the term. <laughs> Speedsters <laughs> is one of the dumbest, most obvious terms you could ever use. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you love Judge Judy, you're going to love Flash Judy. I think that this is just... Uh, that makes sense. Yeah, no, this is, this is insane. And it's insane because even the characters are talking about how insane it is while the comic is happening. But the art is super tight bananas. Hmm. See, I feel like, guys, we're just a couple of podcasters. And what I mean by that is uh, we do podcasts. Podsters? That's why they, Are we yeah. podsters? I just feel yeah. like there's too many podcasters and they need to slow down. <laughs> why don't we talk about Spy <laughs> I mean, Tinkling? That's true, I too, mean, Alex. It, it is actually true. Spy Tinkling Spider-Man number one from Marvel, written by Saladin Ahmed, art by Juan Ferreira. This is the cover promises the scariest Spider-Man story of all time. And in it, big spoilers here, but just to talk about what the issue is about, Peter Parker going on one of his regular old adventures. When he wakes up, nobody knows who he is, and he is trapped on the worst subway ride of all time. Well, as a New Yorker, I, yeah. as a New Yorker I found it to be pretty the normal. Second worst. The second worst? Yeah. I've seen that conductor many times on the subway. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what do you think? Did it live up to the promise of the cover was this the scariest spider-man story of all time i'll say no but you guys take it away yeah i also agree it wasn't but uh the art really is impressive i love the kind of way it starts and the different tones it really has such a cool kind of unique artistic look here so i really appreciated how different it was from other spider-man comics artistically it's a lot of fun yeah he kind of wakes up in a night where nightmare world with nobody recognize him so interesting setup cool i feel like they oversold it with the scariest stuff but uh other than that i still think it's a lot of fun but artistically it's quite an achievement name another scarier spider-man story i guess i would say the, the one where he shows his dick <laughs> wow very upset very aggressively <laughs> I I was going to say, actually, uh, Spider-Man Hooky, which is also one of my favorite graphic novels of all mm. time, where he fights. He Spider-Man is sick. He gets sucked to this other dimension with a girl. They're on a boat. They're floating around like through this fantastical fairyland, and they get attacked by a cockroach. And they're like, ew, a cockroach. And then every time the cockroach comes back, I forget the name of the creature, but it comes back bigger and more horrific every time. And 
it's a fantastic story of Spider-Man absolutely on his back legs the entire time, unable to beat mm. this creature that just becomes worse and worse and more monstrous as it goes. So good call. I love that one. This to me feels like what if you took Peter Parker and threw him in the goon is what it feels like. Mm. And I don't buy that. I do like That's to a get good away call. from my negativity, like the character designs of the monsters. It's yeah. essentially throwing him into like the goon meets uh, not Wizard of Oz, Alice in Wonderland, as he stumbles through these various things that are trying to kill him on a train. Um, so I like all that. It's very similar to the train focused horror story we talked about last week, which I think was Destiny's Gate or Destiny Gate, where I Destiny's wish this child. was one issue. Like, I wish we just sort of had a Tales for the Crypt. Peter Parker gets thrown into this horrific situation. I'd, I'd be up for like six creepy tales involving Peter right. Parker. Is, I guess what I too was surprised that it was going to be continued, but I will say I liked uh, all the subway stuff. I thought was really well done and it was drawn in a way that was like, this is creepy. And it, it sustained that, which I think is really hard to do with like a, a jump scare style uh, reveal that we have in this issue. So like, I'm not saying it was the scariest thing in the world, but I thought they had lived up to the cover enough for my taste. It's definitely scarier than your regular Spider-Man comic, I would say. There it is. Not currently, but yeah. I mean, the thing is, if you are, are scared of being late, then any Spider-Man book is really upsetting. <laughs> Subgenre number one. I'm not one. scared of being like those. <laughs> oh, no, you're not. Subgenre number one from Dark Horse Comics, written by Matt Kinn, art by Wilfredo Torres. This book, I think, was probably my pick of the week. We'll see if I can that's, stick that's with it. That's what you said earlier. We'll, we'll see if I stick with it when we go through everything. But reading this book, I always love a good Matt Kinn book. But this book got me exactly the way that I think Matt Kinn wants to get the reader, which is you're picking it up. And you're reading this like hard boiled Blade Runner S detective who's like, here I am doing my hard boiled Blade Runner S detective stuff. And you're like, okay, I get it. There's a level of meta there. But when are we going to really Matt Kent this up? Like, when are we going to really mess up the reality of this thing? When is it coming? There's this anticipation the entire time, and he builds it and builds it, at least for me when I was reading it, until there is that inevitable twist. And it's bigger and weirder than uh, certainly I expected. Um, I loved it. Could not wait to read the next issue after that twist about two thirds of the way through this one. And also Wilfredo Torres's art. I think it's a very different look for a Matt Kent book, which mm. tends to be through Matt Kent style, mind you, but like very sketchy, a little more exaggerated, a little, a little more cartoony. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this feels a little more like your typical dark horse book, you know, but, or like a, said, a Prince Valiant or more fantasy focused mm -hmm. uh, story, which I think really supports the the story that's being told here. I feel like the big twist was on page 13 when um, he meets up with someone in front of a Sporo restaurant, which is a, a pizza place. No, it's Sporo. Sporo. That's the twist. Uh, Pete, that's oh. your favorite pizza place. You always go there when you go to New York, right? Uh, yeah, it's a horrible place. Uh, yeah, slice. I'd like to talk about the Torres art of it all. I, I really love the art style. It's got kind of like a tripped out kind of fun vibe to it. I think this uh, issue does a great job of setting up this kind of cool world. Uh, has some action and adventure. I love uh, I love showing a bar with a bunch of people passed out drunk on the floor. You know what I mean? It, I love that vibe. It's a, Feels it's like a home. Fun. Yeah, it's a fun vibe. Uh, so, yeah, I think like uh, Zalvatron, uh, I read it and did get very excited for more. I, I mean, I'll also throw out there real quick and then sorry to turn it over to you, Justin. It looks like you were about to say something, but I think no, I was gonna say good. this also has a lot to say about AI and its intersection with art. That's the thing that's running through the background and sometimes the foreground of this entire thing in terms of creation and stealing. Can AI be art? Um, can you embrace other genres and use other genres? How close is that to AI stealing other people's creations that I think ultimately is what Matt Kent is getting at with this book. So lots to say, but layered over a very typical hard boiled detective thing. So if that's your jam, check it out and stop saying hard boiled detective. Get ready to it's really to boiled it. hard. Oh, hard boiled detective. Right. It's very hard boiled. Pete, have you had, you want a soft boiled detective story where everything's a little I like mushy? I detectives over easy. 
Superman number seven from DC Comics, written by Joshua Williamson. This, this new persona is going to be dicey for us. <laughs> oh, boy. We got a lot more books to cover. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to be able to keep it up to the end, to be honest, or past this point. Art by Gleb Melnikov, <laughs> Dan Jurgens, Norm Rapmund, and Edwin Galman. This is the 850th issue, is what they're numbering of Superman or something like that. Whatever yes, it is, um, it's an anniversary issue, but there's some big stuff going down as the Super Family fights the Chained, a villain potentially who was trapped by Lex Luthor years earlier and freed by Superman. But then we are also get some big surprising changes for Lex Luthor, at least in terms of his family as well. What did you guys think about this issue? Uh, do you think? <laughs> what? <laughs> wow. A are we just doing, yeah. from we're just doing sound effects for our reviews now? Well, okay. I just think that review, ooh, I, I, you know, uh, you know, this is like, ooh, let's meet Lex Luthor's family. Like, uh, what? I don't, I don't care about that. Just doing that shoulder shake because Daniel Warren Johnson did it, and you want to be like him. You, the, you didn't do that before him. Wow. What are you talking about? Don't fucking come for me, you motherfucker. I, I, I just. <laughs> you don't want to meet Lex's fam? No, I think the art is really fantastic. I very much enjoyed that. But that's about all I enjoyed. I, I have been enjoying the Superman run. I just, you know, don't, don't give Lex more. You know what I mean? Well, Pete, what did you feel about the uh, the section with Brainiac and you got your uh, Lobo folks for the Zarnians yeah, hanging out? Three like... Lobos now. Brainiac is they tease this in your Comic Con, so potential spoiler, but they DC put it out there. Apparently, they're going to have a Queen Brainiac is going to show up. That's part of the things that he's making. And there's going to be a big Brainiac event that's going to kick off next year through Superman yeah. and some other titles. I don't know. Pete, that's triple, I... the, triple the Space Wolverines that you usually get. Mm -hmm. I really like what Joshua Williamson is building here. I did like the Lex Luthor family reveal. Spoilers. Me too. We get to meet his mom comes back in a way where he's like, I thought you were dead. And she's like, I'm not dead. Leave me alone. And then they bring in Lena Luther, who is not his sister in this continuity, but actually his daughter. So I don't know. I love the idea of throwing in a bunch of weird swerves for Lex. I really like the focus on Lex here. Um, I kind of missed the tension of the era where Lex was on the Justice League because I thought there was that was a fun like Ugh, when is he gonna go bad when is he gonna betray everybody and he does it because he's like nope this is the best he always does what is the smartest best thing for him so throwing yeah. him for a loop I think is a fun place to put Lex flu there agree I like I like all of that uh, do we think we need to see a Perry White J Jonah Jameson uh, crossover event Oh man, Where like these two. Yeah, because they're basically the same, Pretty almost. Much. Yes. Uh, I was Big cigar break on the roof situation. We didn't get the shoe dropping with Perry White, like knowing about Lex Luthor's crimes or whatever that big secret was. I'm honestly forgetting. Um, but I don't know. We'll see. Lots of stuff going on. Moon yeah. Knight, number 28 from Marvel, written by Jed McKay, art by Frederico Sabatini. I feel like this is worth talking about because we're heading towards the depth of Moon Knight. But I got to be honest with you, I don't know what's going on here. You guys take it away, please. Uh, well, let me say I'm a huge Jed McKay fan, but there's something about this Moon Knight book where I'm like, did I miss like an a full arc that sets up a lot of this stuff? Because I don't quite get it either. I like the uh, the action and the way the characters are pitched against each other, but I just don't know uh, what's happening. There's a you lot going mean? on, and the introduction of like eight ball here makes me think you got to be like really coked up to understand all the different things going on at once. Maybe that's the trick. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean the kiss moment was really nice, but then kind of like leaving her on that trap was kind of uh, heartbreaking. That was uh, a weird, can we talk about that for a second? That was a weird moment because I like the idea of a Moon Knight Tigra relationship. Me too. Yeah, I love that stuff. Very into yeah. that. But the idea that she's like, Ugh, I stepped out of mine, go do your thing. And he's like, sounds good. See you later. Let's have a kiss. It leaves and that one panel, which obviously purposeful, but that one panel of cutting back to her, like looking down, she's like, well, 
Could yeah, just kind of like spine. hugging her legs, just kind of sitting there. Well, no, you just can't like, move. Yeah. Well, she's so fast. You would think that maybe she, yeah. of all people, could get away from the bomb in time. So I don't know, man. It was just like, don't leave her there. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, but the I do like a lot of the different action that's going on. It's, it has a fun kind of vibe to it. I really love the style of art. There's a very angular kind of look it, to it, very, which works. The art is very kinetic, which yeah. I really like. Yeah, I think that it works really nicely and sets off kind of a cool tone. Uh, I really like the the Greer Moon Knight romance as well. Um, I want to see more of that, even if they have to spend the rest of their lives standing on that little square. This yeah, that's is great. Right. I'll, they got to have the wedding. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's, when you give somebody a Valentine's card that says, be mine, that's what you mean, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It means wow. join me on this mine. Yeah. <laughs> Headless. What is been... marriage? What is marriage if not <laughs> no, stepping on the same mine and staying there for the rest of your lives Absolutely. emotionally? Wow. Things going well for you, Justin? Great. I love this mine. I love standing on this mine. <laughs> Headless Horseman Annual no, 2020, number 2023, 2023 from Dark Horse Comics written by Lucas Kettner, Angela Slater. Christy Porter at Philip Sevy, Olivia Stevens, David Desmalchian, and Leah Kilpatrick. Art by Lucas Kettner, Valeria Burzo, Philip Sevy, Olivia Stevens, and Tyler Crook. This is your classic spooky tales in the mood of Tales for the Crypt, but here we're getting a headless narrator telling those tales. There's as you it's like 36 pages or something like that. So if you could tell from the the uh, lineup, they're much shorter, punchier stories going on here. We're not getting like two or three stories. There's a lot of shorter ones. What'd you think about this collection? Well, first off, that f first story, you know what I mean? I mean, you guys as a parent had to be freaking out. I was freaking out. I was like, oh my God, when are you going to notice your child is gone, you fucking asshole? Oh, even that's the, fun... the second one. The uh, first one was about like the Nintendo, the entertainment system. Yeah, character. yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, the second one. And yeah, like was such a fun twist, though, where, uh, you know, the, the child is also a monster. And I was like, oh, thank God, because I, you know, the stress of uh, the lost child was was too much for me. I really enjoyed that one. And also the next one, the chaperone, I thought was like also very fucked up and really well done. You know, we read a lot of these, especially this month. Mm -hmm. these um anthologies but this one despite the fact that the headless horseman at the top and bottom of the book is sort of like very goofy i found these stories to be more um singular and horrifying than some of the other ones we've read yeah i i, I can't say this is my favorite horror anthology that we've read necessarily but i do think to your point it goes pretty hardcore if that's what you're looking for and the art is good i can't fault anything that includes tyler crook one of my favorite artists working yeah. that day. And I love the Tyler Crook one as well, which is like sort of a flip where the monster's haunted house is seeing us humans being ourselves. No. Um, so good stuff. Fun. It's a fun lark to pick up. Catwoman number 58 from DC Comics, written by Teeny Howard, art by Nico Leon. This is continuing the Gotham War storyline. Turns out Batman and Catwoman maybe not on opposite sides. In fact, there's a rogue element going on here with Vandal Savage, who has bought Wayne Manor and gathered together Catwoman's thief army to try to gather a bunch of mystical rocks in order to make everybody in Gotham immortal and, uh, I don't know, presumably take over the world after that. So some big emotional stuff going <laughs> on in this issue when it comes to Bat and Cat in particular. So I'm going to turn to our Bat and Cat fan romance expert, Pete, for his opinion on this issue. Yeah, I love the Bat and Cat stuff. I think it starts off, it's a nice kind of uh, start for the comic, uh, you know, and it kind of builds uh, the, to the kind of last line, uh, which is great. Uh, I love the art style, a lot of great action. I can't wait for more. I'm loving this whole kind of like Bat vs. Cat splitting Gotham down the middle. Whose side are you on? I think, uh, you know, uh, Teeny Howard is killing this. This is a lot of fun. I really can't wait for the uh, next issue. I also like how Batman is like, you know, maybe oh, finally opening up and willing to talk. He's like, I think we all need to talk this out. And I was like, yeah, Batman, let's talk it the fuck out, bro. 
Uh, that's true. In this issue, Batman is being reasonable. It's just yep. a little tricky to come to that after the last issue when he made Jason Todd ruined. He <laughs> ruined his brain. <laughs> he just did that. And so in this issue, he's like, we really need to just settle this. I was like, he's right. Your Robin is, oh, he can't do anything anymore. You've broken him. So I just think this event is a little messy. I like some of the oh, elements. I actually you. like the Vandal Savage stuff. Life is the, messy. Uh, true, but not like this. And it, reading this issue made me wish that Cat, the, that Catwoman's arc after all the Bat and Cat stuff was her going to Europe and doing some other stuff. Because seeing them together again, it, it's like it's like watching two exes bump into each other where you're like, they shouldn't be talking to each other right now. They just broke up. Dude, no. First off, she already did that after they almost got married and then uh, she went to Europe. So she can't just keep going to Europe every time they have a, a, a tough It's a great moment. getaway. Great getaway. I love the panel where Bruce completely crumples and leaves. Oh, my God. Yeah. His chest for a moment and is like, I don't know what I'm doing. Please help me here before they spring into action. Of course, I thought that was a really good emotional beat. I love how Nico Leon draws Vandal Savage like an Umbrella Academy character, just like he's just, yeah. he's just a Dorito. I get that That's reference. Much it. Um, so that looks great. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. The whole thing where Catwoman was like, what did you do with Jason? And Batman was like, don't worry about it. It's fine. It'll be fine. And meanwhile, Jason's like, ah! Yeah. <laughs> the entire <laughs> issue. It is so messed up what Batman yeah. did to Jason Todd. Yes. I don't know how, other than the fact that I've been reading comics for decades at this point, like, I don't know how they work Batman out of this one where everybody isn't like, Hey man, you're the villain now. We gotta lock you up and take away all of your privileges. I, I just feel like all the other writers on this event must read Chip Zdarsky's book and be like, Jesus, dude, how do I make this group all hang out together? Batman's this crazy person. Yeah. Well, speaking of crazy people, The Incredible Hulk, number five from Marvel, written by Philip Kenny Johnson and Vita Ayala, art by Travel Foreman and Aletha E. Martinez. And the front story, Incredible Hulk, is mixing it up with Man-Thing and dealing with a horrific swamp monster that is tied to a small child. The backstory, we're, I think, continue to follow this new hero who has shown up in the Marvel Universe through a bunch of backstories, um, but I could be wrong about that one. Oh, what would you guys think about this? Issue? He's the new Power Man. Right. Oh, yes. Oh, the, sorry. This is the one with the new power mind. I was thinking of another issue. I apologize. Yeah. Well, uh, but take it away. This, <laughs> this is, um, I like this uh, art. This is Travel Foreman sort of filling in uh, for on this run before we get back to the main artist next issue. Uh, but talking to Philip Kennedy Johnson about this book, like you just see like the, the horror the horror on horror that he's diving into here and continues to, you know, gets down to just individual panels. And I really like it. It's such a different swing on all of this. And it's really hard to tell what's happening. There's a truly horrifying, in a good way. I mean, like, I don't know where Hulk is going in any way in this run. There's a truly horrifying transformation where Hulk goes back to Bruce, which I was oh, like, yeah. yikes, that's <laughs> one, one of the including the entire run of immortal hulk the worst hulk transformation i've ever seen and well, right. complimentarily it's Compl it's yes. up there for sure it's up there for sure yeah the the body horror kind of element of this comic is impressive um it's it's something for sure that the creepy art style the, the the tone of it they're really kind of leaning into it in a kind of a unique cool way yeah, this continues to be powerful and moving. I am enjoying what's happening, even though it's super gross. But uh, yeah, it's very intriguing. Super gross bananas, would you say? Yeah, yeah. super gross bananas. Which, I got some super gross bananas in my uh, my <laughs> kitchen right now. I love the Hulk barfs. It's eight panels of transformation. In the third one, he's like just straight up barfs. <laughs> he's doing that. Like, everyone's worried about his clothes. He's flipping his stomach every time he transforms back. Swan Songs, number four from Image Comics, written by W. Maxwell Prince, art by uh -oh. Caitlin Yarsky. We did actually talk to Caitlin Yarsky at Baltimore Comic Con about this very book. You can listen to our interview 
that we did with her in the comic book club feed. But this is another part of this anthology focusing on final moments. Here we get a Mad Libs version of a bank robbery kind of gone wrong. Love this book. I love that how light this was in contrast to say an ice cream man or something else from w maxwell prince and caitlin yarsky's art is impeccable in every issue that she does oh yeah the yarsky i I was a big fan of this great ending nice tone like i feel like uh w maxwell prince is really modulating tones something i think ice cream man is such a like high anxiety comic but with this book he gets to modulate tones in a different way and come at them uh, the stories from another angle but still gives us the horrifying twist that we love and a, just a great ending to this i thought well i, I you know we kind of got left hanging a little bit with the ending but anyways i i think this is like uh very heartbreaking and i was like oh what is this gonna be and then i saw the w maxwell friends and i was like oh shit here we go. Yeah, it's a heartbreaking tale of asshole brothers and uh, a guy who's really addicted to Mad Libs here. Um, you know, which, and then we which ca- is sadder to you, real quick, the asshole brothers thing or addicted to Mad Libs? I would say the asshole brothers thing for sure. Yeah. Of addictions, Mad Libs is a pretty at least one of the safer ones. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously his addiction is very is- goopy. <laughs> it's very right in. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Good. Yeah. I, it's interesting you say that, Pete, because I think the whole point of the issue, and this is getting into spoilers, but throughout the book, this guy is given these Mad Libs and he's filling them in. Most of it is filled in, except for the last Mad Lib, which gives us an indication of how things end. So it is very much, and this is the thing that I really appreciate about it, to the point that Justin is saying, is... Ice Cream Man is nihilistic. Everything is bad all the time. Occasionally there's these little glimmers of hope, but they're always taken away. The rug is always pulled out from under you. Here, it is up to the reader. It's very a glass half full, glass half empty situation where if you read it and you're like, well, this guy's screwed, that's how you fill in the Mad Lib at the end. And otherwise you're like, nope, he gets himself out of the situation. That's how you read the Mad Lib at the end. And I thought that was kind of a genius way of ending the issue is leaving it up to the reader. Do you want to look at the story positively? This guy learned something from a situation or do you want to look at it negatively? He is trapped in the inevitability of his life. The lady or the tiger. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you choose your brother or do you murder your brother? You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, we all made that call at one point. Right, and the positive result is you murder your brother, right, Pete? Yeah, exactly. We all got brothers. Yeah. Or you, you don't need to murder him, you just need to slow him down a little bit. You know what I'm yeah. saying? <laughs> oh, so you're saying just clip him with the Real car? Real quick, we all have just brothers. Clip just mention what, like, what would be the most positive thing to happen to your brother. Three, two, one. Run him Smother him with a pillow. Over, yep. Okay. <laughs> Great, there we go. Great. We I all agree. Like you, yeah. <laughs> It's good that none of our brothers listen to this podcast. Why don't we move on and talk about Fables number 160 from DC Comics, written by Billy Lillingham, art by Mark Buckingham. I got to tell you guys. The hams. The hams. The, the hams. Two, double. Look at them two hams. Couple sweet of, hams right there. Oh, man, this is sweet hams right there. It is. I don't know how much you guys paid attention to this, but it is very weird reading this book after everything that went down with Bill Willingham. And for listeners who are not familiar with what down with Bill Willingham, basically he got from his telling uber frustrated with DC specifically because of this book. Because he said all of his scripts were done. It wasn't about Mark Buckingham. DC was dragging their feet with getting it out. And so he decided he's sick and tired of what they were doing. Bless you, Pete. And instead, he is going to release fables to the public domain. It still hasn't been conclusively clarified whether he could actually do that. DC was like, it's not in the public domain. He doesn't know what he's talking about. But it's very strange reading this book, knowing now that DC has designated it as number 160 out of 162 and they're like we're done with this we're not, we're yeah. not doing anything more it's, after this. so it's disappointing because yeah. you know uh the hams you know kind of got 
effed over when uh, you know you know i think it was like fox was gonna buy this for a show and then they said no we're just gonna kind of deep cut do this but kind of not give you any money or credit abc abc Uh, abc ABC. and don't f the hams yeah you don't f the hams and then so they kind of like all right fine that's not gonna happen they went back to the comic and made it great again and so like uh, i just think that it is such an amazing original cool comic yes it's with characters that are kind of you know old and whatever but what they've brought to this comic is so creative and so cool and makes it seem fresh uh with characters we've seen so many different ways it's it's just heartbreaking that uh you know they're they're still kind of getting effed over on this you know what i mean yeah, don't have the hams. I mean, this is one of the most consistent titles yes. that has uh, come out in decades. And it just continues to be like a great story where these characters are slid forward in a, a great way. I worry for Bigby yeah. in all of these issues, especially if these are the last two. Like, it's good. The tension's there, even after all these issues. Uh, but- I will say, just in terms of this story, I understand what you guys are saying, but I, I love Mark Buckingham's art. I think it's really good. Yes. I don't, I still don't quite understand the direction of this new arc. In this issue, we're getting a big, big B Wolf versus Peter Pan fight. It's very cool, drawn really well, plotted out very well. But I yeah. always feel like with this book, we're cutting in like, and here's a snapshot of this world for a couple of pages. See you next month. And I don't know, it doesn't have the same forward momentum as when Geppetto was the main villain of the book. And this is true of the main run of Fables as well. I think it lost that inertia once the battle for Fable Town was done and it just kind of kept going. So we'll see how it wraps up here. I'm still going to read the last two issues of the book, but... Oh, yeah. You have time for that, right? Yeah, I think You have time to read those last two issues. Are you too busy? Yeah, I'm, I got a lot of stuff going on. Alex is trying to F the hams, Pete. <laughs> Dude, stop effing the hams, bro, because they do nothing but create amazing story here that's uh, really impressive, not only artistically, but story-wise. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's just upsetting to hear you say that because, like, I'm having a great time here. I mean, I don't know what's more exciting than a giant wolf eating a fucking dude. Just straight up eating people out here and you're like, yawn, well, fuck I'll this. Well, I'll tell you what, what, I, what I've been kind of doing is I've been <laughs> taking the transcripts of our conversations and editing them down and putting them up as a review on the website. And I can't wait to headline this, Fables 160, don't F the hams. That's going to be yeah. It's really show. people yeah. behind the curtain there. It kind of really if you know, is. you know. If you know, you know. <laughs> what do we talk about? Invincible Iron Man number eleven from Marvel, written by Jerry Dugan, art by yes. Andrea. Di- the dudes. Tony Stark and Emma Frost are married, and they're going on their honeymoon. honeymoon. Come on, where was the air quotes, motherfucker? They're not real married. No, they they're they're married. actually got no. married. No, it's a they cover. went to Vegas. Did so you read married. this? They got Did you married read this in a comic? legal ceremony. I don't know why I can't oh, speak right God. now. What the fuck, man? They're not I, real married. They are it's a cover. Stop fighting it. Stay, stop fighting it, Pete, because I actually love this relationship. I want to see actual sparks fly between these two. I love where it's going. Iron Man hasn't been fun like this in so long. I think it's great. I buy all the stuff. This feels closer to, like... Robert Downey Jr. playing Iron Man than they've been able to do in all the years since that movie came out. This is I, I this is so good, I think. What movie are you talking about? Iron Man? Yeah. No, I'm talking about Chaplin. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> you said that movie like you couldn't think of the title, like it was escaping no, you or something. <laughs> all the movies. Yeah, fucking Iron Man. Uh, I know what movie I'm talking about. We're talking right. about Iron Man the comic. Right. Well, it's just weird that you said <laughs> the, the, Anyways. Less than I, zero. I do agree that, like, this is a great matchup because it's two assholes. So, like, it's kind of fun. But, um, yeah, I think they are long playing this relationship in a smart way where it's like we're not getting stuff that we're looking for yet. Um, but there are, there are little tones of it. There are little hints of it, which I appreciate. So it's great. Match the assholes, uh, you're saying. Yeah, match yeah. Up the assholes. Yeah, you got to match up the assholes, which you I think is. You got to take those two hams and jam them together. 
Got to get it all. Got to get it all. Exactly. Ham jam. That's not what we're talking ham jam. about. We're not talking about a ham <laughs> jam. Halves, right? We got a we got a ham jam. Is we're we not talking here. about ham jams here. We're talking about two assholes. So stop yeah, it. Two assholes. That's a ham two jam. Assholes, no, that's it's a ham not. Jam. It's, it's, <laughs> that's a ham totally jam. Separate when thing. you f the hams wrong, you get a ham jam. No, that's not true. We it's got a ham true. jam, and it's it's. I love a ham jam, and we're I'm loving this book. <laughs> and so, Alex, I guess that can be the one word review. But I would, I'll tell you what, that'll be all the headlines this week. <laughs> it's oh, yeah. oh, yeah, you guys jam. are skipping over something that's really dumb in this book that I want to talk about. Oh, yeah. Like Iron Man and all this oh, technology. We're skipping over something dumb? Go ahead. <laughs> what are you trying to say, you fucking asshole? No, we're doing something dumb. We're not yes, skipping I, it. Okay. <laughs> um, Iron Man's big fucking move in this is he has a magical cane now. Like, what the fuck was that? You're supposed I, to be a technology guy, and now you got a magical cane that you're can, super can, proud can of. Talk about this that you're second, beating so. other superheroes with it. You're just like, hey, check this out. I didn't see this coming out, Spider Man. Whoopa! Like, what are we I, doing? Okay, We're so, beating people with a cane in a comic book. Why is this a thing? I He's find it older. inherently annoying the idea that they're constantly like, what? Decades ago, somebody introduced adamantia, but now we have to introduce all of these other made-up metals into the book. And this one is the strongest one ever, and nobody can detect it. And it's awesome, and it's got all the—it's like the Mary Sue of metals, essentially. Mm. And uh, that is kind of annoying to me. But the way that it's executed, with Tony Stark going to various people and be like, "What are you doing?" And <laughs> with him, he's just, just hitting like, people with a cane. Caning Spider-Man <laughs> in the ankle is. Very funny. It's dumb. It it's really dumb. No, I like it. That's called committing it. to the bit. And yeah. he's his whole thing. I don't know if you know this, but he's Iron Man. His whole thing is metal. So of course he's not. He wants a better metal. He's metal. He yeah. just. It's a cane. This is really dumb. He's hitting people it's with a cane. It's gonna turn into armor. And then he's gonna have armor, and he's gonna fight against them. He's I gonna have cane think, armor. No, he's gonna become whole... Iron Cane. <laughs> So we don't need to talk about this too much, but we have been talking about how the fall of X stuff is eventually going to start wrapping up and kick to the final phase of the Krakoa era. They announced this at New York Comic Con. It's going to start ending in January. And I really feel like Iron Man, in a shocking way, is doing a better job of giving the inevitable danger of we got to fight back against this than the yes. x-men books like he's yeah. the he's the he's the uh the professor x that we've been waiting for yeah the <laughs> the i really do think so because like that scene of him looking up the sentinels in the sky being like we got to take them down we got to take the fight to them like there's a lot of danger for this world and I... stop giving him more credit than he deserves he came up with a cane and he's hitting people with it like this well, is what so I was saying dumb. earlier with... take down spider-man by hitting His him in the ankle. ankle which is something and... that norman osborne has been trying to do for years unsuccessfully in the movie chaplain robert downey jr entertains a generation with a cane it's all right there he does a trick he does some yeah. fun tricks He's, he's right. a real Rogue Son, I would say, and so is Rogue Son number 16 from Image <laughs> Comics, written by Ryan Parrott, art <laughs> by Abel and Marco Renna. Lots of stuff going down in the world of Rogue Son. We've got our main character is trapped inside of the Sunstone with his dad and his grandfather and a bunch of other ancestral Rogue Sons who are after him. Meanwhile, one of the older Rogue Sons has taken over his body and is putting together a group of villains to take over the world, destroy the world, not entirely clear, but a bunch of our heroes are trying to catch on to it. This is definitely the busiest issue of this so far. Yeah. Um, I still Action really in a good way. Yeah. Uh, yes, action-packed. Uh, why don't you guys take it away? Because I know I'm always yeah. in the mood for this series. Yeah, this is super type Ooh. bananas art. Really cool. Tons of stuff go down, as you said. Uh, also, like, uh, spoilers, but uh, it's great kind of, like, last words uh, in this. Uh, I, I love that kind of moment where someone's just like, well, shit. 
and then sliced in half. Fun stuff, just fun stuff, you know? Uh, but yeah, there's there's a ton that you get in this issue, so you really get your money's worth in this, but this continues just to be an, not only an unbelievably drawn book, but uh, uh, so much uh, cool story and action. So yeah, another great ish. They've been able to cram a remarkable amount of mythology into this massive verse title and just keep still keeping it on the rails. And it, the, all of the things that happen in this issue are complex, but it's told very like meticulously walk, that we get walked through it in, in a nice way that you're still you're with it. Yep. Green Lantern War Journal number two from DC Comics, written by Philip Kennedy Johnson, art by Montos, John Stewart. He's looking for a job in Metropolis and chatting with Steel about potentially working at Steelworks. Meanwhile, a evil revenant star sapphire variant type thing from beyond the stars is coming directly for him and infecting a bunch of other Green Lanterns. Very similar to his work on Hulk. I love the amount of actual horror that Philip Kennedy Johnson is bringing into this book. This is not what I expected from the title Green Lantern War Journal. I expected it to be like guns ablazing, pew, pew, pew. And that's not what it is. This is this is a horror book, played and simple, through the lens of Green Lantern. It's definitely working there. There's some great, some really lovely emotional work from Montos, particularly in the relationship between Jon Stewart and his mom in this book that yeah, I really yeah. thought was really wonderful. Uh, it was turn it over to you guys. Yeah, it was a little rough to, you know, on Bring Your Mom to Work Day, uh, you know, for Jon Stewart to kind of uh, uh, have this happen to him. You know, it's got to be embarrassing uh, to get bit by a zombie in front of your mom like that. So, uh, mm. yeah, I do agree with what you were that saying. That happened though. to the other Jon Stewart on The Daily Show once, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he got yeah I thought we were going to get more sort of, like, pithy takes on uh, recent events in this Jon Stewart book. <laughs> well, now uh, that John Stewart is dead at the end of this issue, they're going to bring in Trevor Noah. Trevor Noah of the <laughs> good. Yeah, Sorry, I, I think they should. Up on that one. Anyways, <laughs> yeah, I just think uh, this is uh, continues to be a lot of fun, and Philip Connolly Johnson is amping up the action. So, yeah, these are these issues are moving quick. I'm looking forward to more. You could really see his work on um, aliens, the alien stuff at Marvel yeah. that. Uh, uh, over here, I, I believe it It really feels like able to move in and out of characters that we don't know very long, but get a sense of them. And then we get to see them just straight up killed. Crypt of <laughs> Shadows, number one from Marvel, written by Al Ewing, Sarah Gailey, Steve Orlando, Kevin Scott, and Declan Shalvey. Art by Paul Azaceda, Paul Davidson, Dev Malia Pramanek, Alex Linz, and Edder Messias. This is another horror anthology but here it is set in the world of marvel uh what'd you guys think of this one and how did it compare to the headless horseman anthology that we talked about a couple of group uh books back well you know the you know there there are two great kind of collections i would say uh the brick by brick with uh scarlet witch was a really uh great story um yeah. uh the uh then you get the deadpool story with all the mummy puns which is a lot of fun and then the daredevil kind of man thing uh team up was really cool uh yeah and then uh, you know you kind of throughout you get in this kind of mirror guy which spoilers at the end he kind of gets out which i was like no dr strange's is, bad brother this is bad uh, but yeah, I think they kind of had this kind of cool bit wanting throughout, which was kind of uh, a nice uh, kind of through line there. But yeah, I thought, you know, it's another great collection of stories, unbelievable teams doing it. I mean, unbelievable art and writers. Uh, it's a who's who of uh, comic book uh, artists and writers. So, yeah, it's a who's who the. Uh... I really, I think Steve Orlando uh, has really landed Scarlet Witch as this like perfect character for him to really just be his signature character to write from now yeah, on. We're so I think talk brick more by about brick, that later. Yeah, yeah, I think we might. A brick by brick is really good. I the Daredevil Man thing just makes so much sense, and I was trying to think if they've ever encountered each other before. Um, the Man Without Fear, the uh, the thing that who's touch burns people who feel fear. Oh, so like, that was really cool. And I did, I agree. I liked the way the 
Doctor Strange's mirror brother thing ended up at the end. But I, this yeah. wasn't as scary as Headless was. Yes, uh, I agree. I think also the Daredevil Man Thing story was my favorite of this particular collection. I wasn't totally sold on the Doctor Strange brother thing until it ended up in continuity at the end, which I thought was an interesting yeah. way of ending it. Um, so I enjoyed that. Scrapper number four. Another from, asshole brother. There you go. Scrapper number four from Image Comics, written by Cliff Blazinski and Alex DeCampi. Art by Ryan Kelly and Jordi Belair. This is following a dog who has been augmented with a bunch of cyborg implants and things fighting in a dystopian slash not quite utopian or not even close to utopian future. Finding a lot more about his origin story in this issue. Pete, you're an animal lover. How'd you feel about this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, yeah, this is great. We got the saga continues. We get the cats and the dogs in this. Sleep Love all the cat. different pers personalities that you have kind of working here together. It's a great team up here. Uh, you know, we're trying to take down the smite, you know, and uh, yeah, I really like the adorable human girl that's helping out. So I feel like this is uh, this is a lot of fun. Each kind of uh, issue that we get, the story is growing on me more and more. And uh, I feel like it's doing a great job of building momentum. Looking forward to what's going on. Yeah, these cats don't give a fuck. And I, you must have loved that, Pete. Oh, well, that's, that's cats in general. Yeah. So that's really speaking to you. I really liked the, uh, in the back matter, we saw a bunch of photographs of fans who've dressed <laughs> their dogs up Gorge. like Scrapper, which I thought was really cute. Yeah. Sandman Universe, Nightmare Country, The Glass House, number five from DC Comics, written by James Town the fourth, art by Lizanjo Esterin. As we have the past couple of issues, we have Thessaly, the witch, is trying to figure out what is going on, what manipulation is happening. We get a bunch of hints here about which members of the Endless may or may not be involved, mm -hmm. while the yes. Corinthian is trying to solve some mysteries and do some deals of his own. This continues in my mind to be maybe the most worthy sequel to Sandman ever. Possibly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there haven't been a ton of them, but even like Neil Gaiman's done a couple sort of in the world, but this feels like it, it's right there next to the original series in a really good way. Uh, if that's what you're thinking as well, Alex, using the characters, not having dream himself in it at all which so it he, he was, straddles he was that. a couple of he was in the first series that's right? that's that's true yeah, that's yeah. true but yeah, like yeah, and i guess like as a recurring or main character yes. yeah uh i just think that yeah this is uh i loved how badass the ending was uh you know it had that great line that okay we're then right into the hurricane let's find out like that got me really pumped up uh the art is just super tight bananas i i just uh, jt4 is killing this i just think that this is just so cool so much fun great use of these characters in such a kind of like heightened kind of creepy way that's really building on stuff i love the momentum that we're getting now and uh yeah i cannot wait uh, uh, for the next issue. This continues to be a, a must check out uh, comic book. Uh, I do think the next issue is the last of this particular mini series version of it. Probably not the end of Nightmare Country. Let's hope not. And yeah, I do think we need that to would get be a nightmare. Answers. We're getting a lot of like, what's going on here? Who is behind this? What exactly is the story? So I think we need, I think we need to open it up to, oh no, this is what's actually going on and really plainly kind of lay it out there. And that will allow us to move into whatever the next phase of the story is, but we'll see. And whatever the larger implications to the, the cast, uh, like I feel like that's, I, I'm hoping there will be. Yeah. Scarlet Witch, number nine from Marvel, written by Steve Orlando and Juan Ponce, art by Lorenzo Tometa and Sarah Pacelli and Iguara. Like we talked about earlier, this is Scarlet Witch is teaming up with Magneto's clone. My guy, is, Joe. Yeah, Joseph. Joseph Iosef, if you will. That's what she calls him. And he seems to be heroic, but he's actually not. He is working for uh, Witchfinder, Hexfinder. I'm forgetting the exact name of the character who is trying to hunt down Scarlet Witch. And we get some big stuff going down as we head towards... 
the kind of end of the series. We're going to get it rebooted as Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver very soon after that. But what do you guys think about this issue? This is awesome. This just continues to rock. I love this. I love the Sand Shark. I love that we got Dr. Voodoo. We got Grizzly City in here. I mean, this is just mm, fun stuff. City. And then it's just, uh, you know, a bloody turn at the end. Join us next time. I mean, this is just... Oh, whoo, two fingers off the hand from I our mean, girl this Wanda. Is, yeah, yeah. This is... Oh. Yeah, so I... Uh, yeah, I, Steve Orlando is killing it. The art is super type, and as this is just a uh, such a great use of Scarlet Witch and such a, uh, a gr- great job of uh, teaming up these people for this project because it's a ton of fun. Uh, I agree. I mean, it's great. You got your girl Darcy, Pete. Yeah, uh, come on. Riding along. Uh, I love the the twist. The fact that it was such a like we're friends, uh, Wanda and Yosef, and then at the end. Uh, he becomes he betrays her don't, hex don't, finder don't trust an old dude with long hair you know what i mean yeah you think that pony's a bad sign yeah oh yeah dude totally that's Can why we... i go around and i just clip off long ponies too much yeah <laughs> both Can... i i'm always clipping long ponies like if i see a pony that like is too long you know like a too wide like it's yeah. you gotta be careful though because if you clip a my little pony you're in trouble oh yeah well you think so why have you yeah. ever they're, they're pretty actually happy-go-lucky those little ponies yeah twilight sparkle come on dude yeah Get good luck dude once you Get clip a, a pony you gotta answer to some uh, pissed off uh, fucking parents dude you know what i mean mm. yeah like when he comes down to it, you want to clip a pony or you want a ham jam <laughs> you gotta these are the two issues that these are the issues you don't those never are, clip a pony bro genders. Yeah. <laughs> Kill Your Darlings, number two from Image Comics, what written by that? Ethan X. Parker and Griffin Sheridan, art by Robert Quinn. We had the full team on our podcast a month ago to talk about this very comic book. Oh. And now <laughs> the second issue is finally <laughs> out. This is about a little girl who has pictured a magical land who has been taken over by some evil being spirit demon something like that and it has led to some horrible things happening in her life in this issue i think we get confirmation that it's all real like of the first issue yeah. played it as oh is it real is it not real is she imagining it? Is she's not this issue is like no it's real it's very it's real. real it's been going on for big a very time, long time so big twists big changes here how'd you guys feel about this one it's awesome. This is a ton of fun. I love the little elephant guy. I think he rocks. Uh, yeah, I just think there's a lot of cool character designs. This is a great uh, a comic. Love the action and the story, but also the will they, won't they moments are kind of magical underneath the umbrella. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's how love starts mm. underneath an umbrella. Um, but man, yeah, just... Uh, Super type bananas, great story. This is you're getting you're getting a hack of a package in this. Uh, JT Civil uh, Sizzle loves a, a great hack package. of a package. Hack of a package. You're getting the total pack right here. You're getting I, a hack of a package from JT Sizzle. Hack of a package, JT Sizzle. None of us. None of this makes sense. <laughs> uh, none of the things we're saying makes sense. The, uh, I love the way this book is jumping through time really effectively. Like we get a flashback to the past, which will affect sort of the overall mythology, a quick hit of like picking up where we left off and then jump right forward to a much sadder uh, present day. And Uh, then the story moves forward from there. So really just great, confident narrative happening here. Big moves, big moves throughout this issue that I wasn't expecting. And, you know, I've mentioned this the past couple of weeks. Big moves, little elephants. You know what I mean? Big moves, little elephants. Big moves, little (laughs) elephants. What are you? Right, Pete. Stop. Uh, please stop. Pete and I have a hip hop. Nope. No. Yeah. No, we do not. I've been wanting to see you guys. No, we I want to see you guys. No, we don't. It's Tides called number two four. Hands. Yeah. It's called it's called Walk the Jewels, right? Yeah. Ham gems. Uh, anyway, this book is very good. You should check it out. Let's talk about Titans number four from DC Comics, written by Tom Taylor, art by Nicola Scott. We are still dealing with the death of the Flash from the future. The current Flash is being 
put on reserve at the same time the Titans are going on other missions and dealing with the fact that, I mean, they don't know there's some sort of absolutely horrific alien question mark invasion that's going on, leading to maybe one of the most upsetting paddles that I saw all week, including the Hulk vomiting out his guts and everything mm. in all of those anthologies. The little uh yeah yeah you know, i know what you're talking about everything jumping yeah. out of the mouth yeah <laughs> feathers teeth sort of a sea yeah. anemone energy kind of like a starro situation here but yeah different... don't like it i i don't like it no i don't like it, it reminds either. it reminds me of some of the vampire stuff that i believe tom taylor was also working on across the dc oh, universe see what you did there it's uh, you we're did, sneaking right? up on it so it, it's fun i this flash mystery is a great anchor for this book and then we've got all this uh Beast Boy stuff where he's doing his own thing. Yeah, also great Peacemaker cameo we got in this here ish. But uh, yeah, I Not mean. Not as fun. What? He doesn't have as much fun. He's just doing the work. He's just at his job. He's like at his day job. Yeah, but it's still great to see him, you fucker. Yeah. I, I would love to see him. Hey, listen, man. You know, if I say it's a fun. Uh, Cameo, that's what I mean. You don't have to fucking pick apart my words. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Like, let's focus on what's happening. I uh, just think but, it wasn't super fun to see him. He didn't do anything fun. He was he, We just saw him, to me. Which is fun, because it's Peacemaker. Yeah. I guess, I, I feel I like guess I'm starting to think we have a difference of opinion. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> well, um, I, I think they did a great job of getting you excited for more comic more to more to come in this next issue i i liked the kind of pace of this and all the stuff that went down i think this is uh cool titans fun uh I, regardless I agree. titans of, 4 was a good advertisement for titans 5. is that how we should start <laughs> looking at all comics sold it's, it's kind of true i'm joking but also it's true i mean it's true of literally all things we consume um in almost every way yeah uh including food. don't put Ooh, your children good looking forward to dinner <laughs> <laughs> and this breakfast really sold me on lunch and dinner <laughs> which brings me I to my next some sort of continuity i hope they pick up on what they put uh, and the cliffhanger of breakfast yeah, exactly to be continued yeah. blt sandwich okay <laughs> which brings me to my next point don't put your children in the vault <laughs> I agree, the, Pete. And how apropos that we're going to be talking about Children of the Vault, number three from go. Marvel, written by Dennis Camp. Oh, oh, hold on a second. I hate when people call out transitions, especially on like podcasts. But Pete, that transition was like being like, oh, welcome to the party. Please transition into the rep room. That was like you kicking the door open and then refusing to walk into the party. <laughs> Okay. Bang! I'm not yeah. going in. It was just teeing me up. It was te it was teamwork? Question mark. Art yeah. by no, not art by Nicola Scott. This is art by Luca Maresca. The children of the vault have evolved to a place where they basically have become this Thunderbolts style hero team, who the entire world loves. But part of the reason they love them is they have infected them with a mind virus. The only people who are fighting against them are Cable and Bishop. I've been a little iffy about this series this issue what? was badass like ah. totally just like front to back bishop and cable just 100 percent wrecking shop of the children of the vault doing everything that you've wanted them to do for three issues very fun and just like talking like oh what's your favorite gun what's your favorite gun having a whole fight about it really fun Children of the Vault establishing themselves as just very hard to beat, and then Cable and Bishop slowly taking them down. Just great action across the board. I'm just loving this in general. Dennis Camp is writing this like a larger story about like the brainwashing that's happening from the the uh, Children of the Vault. But I got to shout out. There's two uh, text pieces in this. One, a letter from Cable to Hope about mm -hmm. her being dead, which I thought was just so beautifully written. And then Bishop talking about like different fucked up parts of the timeline uh, or different things around uh, his journal, his journal entries that he's encountered. And that's just cool, too. It, really great package, top to bottom. Hack of a pack. Uh, yeah, I, I think the all the Bishop and Cable stuff were really cool. Uh, love the art. A lot going on in this ish. 
I love Bishop and Cable being absolute assholes to each other throughout time. This is the issue that sold me on. I could read this long term with the two of them forced to be together yes. in different situations. The whole exchange about how Cable, I, I think I'm getting this right, but Cable created a cult that hates Bishop and yeah. blames him for ruining the timeline. And he's like, there's 300 years I can't even walk around the street in. Such a great detail. So just funny. Randomly throughout the, there. Love it. Great stuff. It makes me want to go back and reread that that cable. Oh series. my god, that Dwayne Straczynski so run on cable yeah. is one of the best of all time. I agree. If we yeah. ever get the time, which we definitely don't, but get the time to revisit it, that would be super fun because I love that run. Hexagon Hexagon Bridge number two from Image Comics by Richard Blake. I don't know again what is going on in this book, but Pete, I know you. Pete love loves this. You love the first issue of this, so I'm curious. I definitely wanted to throw this in here to get your opinion on the second issue. Oh, well, great. Yeah, first off, the epic cover. Really loved it. Amazing art, panel designs. Love the vibe of this comic. Uh, you know, sometimes you got to be running from dogs. So just uh, really beautiful mm. panels, really picturesque last panel. Just love everything that's happening in this comic. It's just so artistic and art forward uh it just uh, makes me so happy it's just such a different vibe from uh, a lot of the superhero comics so it just kind of sticks out and is uh just such a nice aperitif in between all the other madness so i love it Ooh, what a lovely gourmand way to look at it i agree it's really nice i don't quite know what's happening uh like you don't Alex always said. have to you know what i mean you Sometimes don't always have to just enjoy it for what it is this is, you know? this is a very european comic i think in terms yes. of european it's I, I it's where catwoman should go to this yes, comic there you go i it, it's very big esoteric ideas that are hard to hold on to the uh, landscapes are very bold and vast in that European style. I think it worked a little better in the first issue for me where we were getting these wild Don't don't be don't ruin it. Landscapes where here we're getting a little bit more human drama, but I don't know. Like you said, it's nice to look at. Fear of the Funhouse presents Toy Box of Terror number 1 from Archie Comics written by Timmy Heeg. Daniel Page and Michael Northrup, art by Ryan Kasky, Tango and Ryan Jampal. This is an anthology giving us spooky tales that are making fun of Megan and Chucky, Chucky and other yeah. things involving killer dolls all through the lens of the Archie comics characters. I was really looking forward to this mainly because like, sure. If you're going to do a Megan parody, make it Cheryl Blossom as Megan. Oh yeah. yeah I know. Also having Archie as the Chucky doll is fun. Mm -hmm. I mean, just Very like, fun. Good, yeah, good it, times. Th this is fun. This is creepy fun. You know, uh, the problem is for me, like having like dolls or is a little too creepy for me. It really kind of freaks me out. And especially when yeah. you get like creepy kids too. Uh, uh, for those stop, of you who don't know, Pete is nightmares. constantly surrounded by dolls in his house. So like, that's why he's unsettled by this book. Yeah. Pete, you, your uh, Precious Moments 86 on eBay, right? Is that correct? I, I just want to plug your store. That's all. I'm trying. No, nobody says precious moments more than Pete Page. <laughs> precious Pete, we call him. Oh, yeah. An off mic, off mic. Precious Pete Page. We would never do it on mic. We would never do it on We're mic. On we'll mic cut right this now. Mm, no, so. we're gonna cut. We'll, we'll cut. Yeah, this. we'll cut it out. Let me just press I, the producer. Button. What'd you think about this anthology, Justin? Um, it's fun. I liked the um, the last bit. I feel like this anthology worked really hard to connect the stories, and I was like, they don't have to. Just let yeah, them hang out. Because right. uh, I, I thought the last one was the, had the most fun. Yes, uh, I, I agree. I didn't quite get the overarching story here, which is something that they do in a lot of these horror books from Archie. But over Archie. for Cheryl with the over three Archie. instead of the E, and like we said, the Chucky archie thing it's cute it's fun it's exactly what you want out of it the forge number five from image comics written by greg rucka and eric troutman art by mike henderson this is an issue where i feel like maybe we missed an issue of this book maybe we didn't read yeah. an issue uh because as far as i remember our badass warriors were trapped on an alien planet fighting their way out 
and now they are on the Empress's homeworld and getting not exactly a relaxing for... day off, but sort of navigating that particular new reality. Mike Henderson's art is so kick-ass throughout this book. Yes. And this mixes the best of Greg Rucka's Lazarus with like alien marines and starship troopers and starship like, troopers was the reference yeah. i was gonna get to like it definitely has that tone where there's some like uh satire here and just sort of making fun of this sci-fi world while at the same time would you like telling... to learn more exactly um i would yeah. uh yeah i yeah i think this is uh um you know like the they were kind of like fighting for their lives and now they're kind of fighting for entertainment value, which was a little kind of undercutting, but, uh, you know, like the kind of romance moments and then the, uh, you know, uh, kind of heightened ending to kind of tune in next time to see what goes down. So yeah, but the art is super type bananas. Cool. Avengers <laughs> Inc. number two for Marvel, written by Al Ewing, art by Leonard Kirk Wasp, and a it's kind of complicated, but basically the body of Whirlwind yeah. and the mind of the Vision are teaming up to solve mysteries out of costume at the behest of Luke Cage, the mayor of New York. Here they are investigating a mystery happening in Avengers Mansion. Absolutely love the first issue. Second issue, I think gets it a little bit into like the Al Ewing headiness that mm. he gets into sometimes, but I still love this concept, love this cast. I also love the fact that like, they're not, they didn't drag out the, Hey, this guy thinks he's vision. Let's wait to bring in vision until issue six. No, they're getting to an issue two, dealing with an issue two, and kind of moving on to whatever the next phase of things is. So I appreciate the fact that they're moving through the plot quickly. And still having like a, a done in one mystery that mm -hmm. they get through in a, in a good, effective way. I think just in the concept is inherently a little difficult because it's the bot, like you just said, the body of whirlwind and this alias of the vision called Victor Shade that isn't the vision, but he seems to have some qualities of vision, but we don't know what the deal is. And that's a little bit of a big meatball to be, have hanging out there. And then vision shows up and it's like, you have to, we have to explain some of this, right? <laughs> and they all are like, right. All the characters are like, right. And they're like, we don't and like, okay, good day. That's the end of this part of the story. So it's just creates sort of like an awkward situation, I think from a storytelling perspective, but I agree with you. Otherwise, I think I love just the concept of this book and I love the standalone mysteries and I like this little squad solving them. Yeah, I agree. I like the squad solving. We got a kind of ghost with a scythe in this one. So that's always scary. You know, those two combinations, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, you know, hologram. It's a, it's a spooky, spooky times. Uh, so, yeah, great art. <sighs> Uh, peace give it up star trek halloween number three from <laughs> idw written by christopher sequera art by joe eisma i've been absolutely loving this series this is about the holodeck has been taken over by red jack a monstrous alien who infects the systems and coincidentally looks like jack the ripper but with blade heads he uh, the crew of the Enterprise, the Next Gen Enterprise, has turned themselves into universal monster styles creatures in order to fight back. It gets even goofier and weirder in this issue. Again, I'm just having such a blast reading this. I think Joe Eisman's art is absolutely so clean and so perfect for this. And I also love that IDW is releasing this weekly. I love yes, like, I agree. An October spooky star trek event is perfect very fun i love wharf from the black lagoon is just <laughs> extra funny to me there's more action for the tng crew and this issue than entire seasons of the television show mm -hmm. i like the cliffhanger at the end it was a really smart turn on it uh, it felt like the story was sort of ending and then they just revved it back up again in an interesting way. It, it's a good read and a surprising hit, a surprising win, I think. Yeah, it's a lot of fun, a kind of monster mashup, and uh, you get like the Scotty, <laughs> uh, Scotty return moment. It was cool. So, yeah. yeah. 
Oh, man. Uh, Pete's, should, Pete's got a ham just... jam. Pete's got a ham jam right now. You need to ham jam sell right it after here. his hams. Yeah, he's got a ham jam. We're like an hour no, and a half jam, into no. this fucking stack. Go fuck yourselves. Hey, man. We love comics. We love talking about them. If this went three hours, I'd be good to go. Let's go. I'm ready to go. I would I'll tell you what. We're about to talk about Local Man number six from Image Comics, written by Tony Fleeks and Tim Seeley, written by Tony Fleeks and Tim Seeley. And I've got at least a tight 30 minutes to talk about this. Oh, my gosh. Pete is I mean, lying me out here is what's going on. He's turned into the lion that sleeps tonight. Justin, what do you think about Local Man? <laughs> Uh, I love this book. It's one of my favorite books coming out on a, on the stands right now. It's just such a good character study, small town focused book. The art's really good, right where we want it to be. I feel like um, in that sort of another book I love, that Texas Blood, like sort of hard-boiled comic hard-boiled great boil uh comic art style uh which is really fun and deepening mysteries character turns while still maintaining this like yeah this guy used to be in the justice league sort of from the 90s uh this is this is an interesting issue for me i really love this book go listen to tony fleeks we talked to him at baltimore comic-con we went very in-depth about local man gold in particular which was the last issue that was released of this, even though it wasn't local band number five or anything like that. This issue is kicking off a new arc, and I feel like its function is to remind us that this dude, who I, I would say is more like a Wildstorm character who got dubbed, or like a Gen yeah. 13 character, or Youngblood, or something like that, um, is not a great guy. Like, I think that was the function of this issue. And then at the end, we kick into a spooky, weird Halloween mystery, which is not what I was necessarily expecting. Love the title. Love the art. I love the fact that, like, you flip it over and you get a faux old school 90s story that ties into the main continuity and tees up things for the future. So this is a great package from front to back. Um, Big fan of this book. But this definitely felt like a setup issue to me personally. Mm. Uh, this, this is a great team. You got uh, the Fleeks and the Sealy working together here. And, uh, you know, they are fantastic. Worth it for them alone. Um, but, yeah, trigger warning on this issue. This is gets real kind of weird for me. I mean, you got this cop who shoots somebody and it's kind of fucked up in a lot of different ways. So uh warning on that that's a tough kind of pill to swallow but uh very interesting and uh pretty crazy daredevil number two from marvel written by saladin ahmed art by aaron cooter daredevil is back in the costume but also a priest at the same time now i don't know if you guys knew about this particular thing but there was yeah. a flap about the first issue and in particular about the villain in there dealing with some potential calls of anti-Semitism uh, for the way the character was depicted. Aaron Cooter fought back against it very vehemently and said, no, that was not the intention at all. That's not what we're doing. You're crazy. You're wrong. That is not what it is. Um, I will say that's not anything that I picked up on. I'm Jewish. Hello. Uh, so yeah. I'm not by the <laughs> deal and all, but... Um, I don't want to contradict rabbis or scholars or anything like that, but I feel like people maybe were looking into it a little too much. That yeah. said, I was very trepidatious about picking this up issue up because I wasn't sure it was going to happen. It avoids that entirely and instead yeah. gets into what I thought was very interesting in terms of essentially the cops versus Daredevil and these kids and how we treat disenfranchised kids. I thought this was a fascinating issue. I thought Aaron Cooter had some phenomenal layouts here. There's one that uses Daredevil's radar vision as a radiating series of rings throughout the page yeah. that I thought was really beautiful. What'd you guys think? Yeah, I I agree. I think it was really beautiful, that kind of moment where he's standing on top. I also thought it was very kind of interesting, this choice he makes of being like, oh my God, there's all these cops here. I'm going to turn into a priest, which I was like, okay. Um, but yeah, I did ben, think ben there. Stuff, ben there. stuff with a kid, the kids was kind of adorable and cool. I enjoy his relationship with the kids and kind of like what he's trying to do for those children, which is really nice. It's kind of a new side to Daredevil that we don't see much. 
Um, but uh, I, yeah, the art is just unbelievable. I really love it. It has kind of like hints of a Romita Jr. vibe. You know what I mean? Just kind of like a, a nice underpinning a little bit like of it. So it has a nose. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm really appreciating what's happening there. Um, sort of a Sandoval in some ways. <laughs> but yeah, uh, you know what I mean. I, I'm excited to uh, check out more. Uh, the art is fantastic in this. It's interesting. Saladin Ahmed is really taking Daredevil's religiosity very seriously, and I feel mm -hmm. like it's always used as like, well, he's you know he's sort of going to he's sad, so he's going to go be very Catholic religious. right now. Yeah, yeah. And this is like approaching it from a different way, where it's not just like a cover he's using or like something he's temporarily upset about and going and dealing with. It feels like the thing that Daredevil and Matt Murdock is constantly returning to and is the main driver and Daredevil feels like more of the mask that he's wearing and thinking he's like, ah, I gotta go do this thing reluctantly or compulsively. So I'm curious if that's just gonna change what the whole idea of this superhero is, um, at least for this run. So that's I that's exciting. Yeah, I really like that idea, and I hope they stick with it. I, I like the way that you said that in terms of Daredevil. Matt Murdock is the primary thing. Daredevil is the secondary thing, because yeah. that's not what we had through Chip Zdarsky's run. That's certainly not what we had through a bunch of other runs before that. So, I don't know. I don't know how long they could keep that up, but... I'd love it if they do. So we'll see. Last but not least, In Hell We Fight, number five yeah, from do. Image Comics, written by John Lehman, art by Jock, our assembled hell denizens trying to get an angel back to a safe space and go through some big changes in this issue. What'd you think about this one? This continues to be awesome. I really love this. I love the art style. It has such a fun tone and feel to it. You know, I mean, how many times have we seen the story of a father who's a dragon who then murders her daughter, and then she's turned into a demon and has to continue her journey? So, uh, sure, it's a tale as old the time, but, you know, it's done really well here. Uh, I love the action and adventure in this. I'm having a blast. Another book, if you're a fan of The Goon, that I think you should check out. I thought this arc ended well. Hints of the Goon. Um, Hints of the Goon. Hints of the Goon. And I think that it uh, there's a nice backup that sort of crystallizes a lot of the story. It feels like we're not going to get more of this for a little while, based on the back matter. But um, it was, ended up being a fun run. Cool. And if you'd like to support this podcast and all the podcasts we do, patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. to Facebook and YouTube. Come hang out. We would love to chat with you about comic books, Apple, Spotify, Android, or the app of your choice. To subscribe, listen, and follow the show at comic book live on Twitter slash X, comic book club live on TikTok and Instagram, comic book club live.com for this podcast and many more. Until next time, here we go. Here's my uh, tight 30 on Local Man. I'll, what I will tell you about Local Man is he got no respect. He got no respect. For, for Rodney Dangerfield, Precious Pete, I'm Ham Jam. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>